Welcome to Wisdom Planet, wisdom worth spreading. Happy listening! Today we are talking about a book about entrepreneurship called The Lean Startup. This book is considered a textbook in the entrepreneurial community, especially among internet product managers in many startup companies, who even refer to it as the Red Bible. So what does it talk about? In simple terms, the core principle of the lean startup is to tell us that in the field of entrepreneurship, low-cost rapid experimentation and learning from failures is more efficient than large-scale repetitive actions. Specifically, this book discusses several points. First, lean startup is about trying and failing with the smallest cost and the fastest speed. Second, the core of lean startup is to validate value assumptions and growth assumptions. Third, Lean Startup is not just a theory of entrepreneurship, it also applies to other fields beyond entrepreneurship. Part 1. Let's first look at the first point, which is that Lean Startup is about trying and failing with the smallest cost and the fastest speed. This actually tells us the concept of Lean Startup, which we will explain in detail next. However, before discussing the concept of Lean Entrepreneurship, let's briefly review the traditional entrepreneurial mindset. In the past, entrepreneurial companies, especially those technology companies that emerged in the 1970s and 1980s, such as Microsoft, followed a simple path. A few technical experts would come together, study the weaknesses of their competitors' products, and then create a better product. They would work quietly behind closed doors, writing code, and after a year, they would release a software product onto the market with a bang. Even now, Microsoft's Windows system follows a similar approach with each updated version. Thousands of engineers lock themselves away for a couple of years to develop a new system like Windows 8, and then another couple of years later, they release Windows 10. That's roughly how it goes. Did you notice that this entrepreneurial approach is a bit like launching a rocket? Launching a rocket is also a process where a group of scientists, who are not concerned with worldly matters, hide in a research base and continuously experiment. The general public has no idea what these people are up to until one day they announce that they have developed a rocket and are ready to launch it. Only then do we realize, oh, they have been making such a big fuss, they are really impressive. This rocket launch style entrepreneurship was a common practice in business startups before the emergence of modern internet companies. What are its problems? You may have already noticed it, yes, it is being disconnected from the market, working in isolation, and being too far away from customers and users. The concept of lean startup is to reverse this approach, instead of rushing to have a group of elites working in isolation to research rockets you should first determine if the market really needs rockets. If people don't need them, wouldn't it be a waste of effort to invest so much in research? The truly scientific approach is the lean startup mindset, which involves taking small steps and iterating quickly. So, running with small steps and iterating quickly means starting with the lowest cost and creating a product that is as simple as possible. This product should only have one core function, Then, observe the reaction of users towards this product. If the reaction is positive, then continue to invest effort in improving the product little by little. Observe the reaction again, make further improvements, and continue to gather feedback until this product becomes a great one. However, if the initial rudimentary version of the product is not being accepted by users at all, then it is best to abandon it decisively. Obviously, the lean startup approach is more scientific, right? Startups love to adopt the lean startup methodology because they can't compete with mature large companies. Large companies have money, people, and resources, so they can afford to make mistakes and waste resources. But startups have nothing and cannot afford fatal errors. They can only carefully experiment and iterate their product versions quickly, gradually improving their products to win over users. This is the concept of Lean Startup. Speaking of this, you may already have some impressions about the term Lean Startup. You might think that this is a methodology suitable for entrepreneurs in the new era, and that this theory must have been developed by small businesses that have fallen into pitfalls and stepped on landmines repeatedly, learning from their mistakes and summarizing this methodology. But actually, that's not the case. 
The concept of lean startup was not proposed by some agile internet company. It was actually introduced by a traditional enterprise, and not just any enterprise, but a giant one. Who? Toyota Motor Corporation from Japan. Toyota was the first to propose a concept called lean production, and the inspiration for lean entrepreneurship comes from lean production. What is lean production? It means maintaining a small scale production with immediate correction of errors. As we all know, Toyota is considered a latecomer in the automotive industry. When it started, giants like Ford and General Motors were already thriving. At that time, these big companies had already reached a highly developed stage of specialization, using professional large machines to produce thousands of parts in one go. In contrast, Toyota used small machines to produce a small number of parts at a time, which was not as specialized. Many different parts were made using the same machine, so the machine had to switch tasks back and forth. Although Toyota can only produce in small quantities and cannot compete head on with large companies, they can still capture some relatively small and scattered local markets. Why is that? Because they are more capable of producing different types of cars. Think about it, when a large car factory produces a batch of cars, they are all exactly the same. If some markets don't like a particular model, it would take them a long time to make adjustments. However, Toyota can use their small machines to make each product different. This way, they can still capture a portion of the market and compete with the big manufacturers, while also being able to make adjustments faster and at a lower cost. It's simple, if I find that a car is not working, I can immediately stop producing it. But a large car factory may have to produce hundreds of thousands of units of a single model, and by the time they realize that the market doesn't need it anymore, it's too late to make adjustments. Over time, this ability has allowed Toyota to enter larger and larger markets. By 2008, it surpassed General Motors and became the world's largest car manufacturer. Speaking of this, does anyone remember the example of the envelope we mentioned earlier? Now you know why sealing a single envelope is faster than sealing them in bulk, right? Repeating the same task may seem more efficient because we mistakenly believe that the more we repeat a simple task, the better we will do it. Unfortunately, in process-oriented work like this, individual performance is not as important as the overall system performance. Batch folding letters, sealing envelopes, and sticking stamps may indeed seem faster, but we often overlook an implicit time factor. The premise of batch processing is that you have to first arrange the envelopes, letter papers, and stamps before you can do them in bulk. Moreover, after completing a task, such as neatly folding 100 sheets of letter paper, you have a large pile that needs to be organized. If your desk is not big enough, you may even need to find an empty space to set aside this pile of semi-finished envelopes before moving on to the next step. We haven't accounted for this additional time. Furthermore, imagine unexpected situations. For example, you fold all 100 sheets of letter paper nicely, but when you try to stuff them into the envelopes, you realize that you folded them too large and they won't fit. In that case, you need to go back to the previous step and check which sheets are folded correctly and which ones are not. All the work done before may have been in vain. With a small batch approach, we immediately identify the problem and solve it on the spot, avoiding making the same mistake again. So, returning to the example of Toyota's lean production, as a large company in a traditional industry, Toyota has taught startup companies a lesson inspiring entrepreneurs to use small batch production for rapid trial and error, quick adjustment and iteration. This is the concept of lean entrepreneurship. The author emphasizes in the book that not only entrepreneurs who start their own businesses by assembling a team, but also those who are responsible for a new product in a large company or need to innovate in a traditional industry, can be considered entrepreneurs in a broad sense. They can all follow the lean startup approach of taking small steps and quickly learning from mistakes. Part 2 After discussing the concept of lean startup, let's take a look at the second point of this book, How to Do Lean Startup. The author believes that the core of lean startup is to validate value assumptions and growth assumptions. Entrepreneurship, in simple terms, 
is when you identify a problem that users have and then provide a solution for it. If the users accept your solution, then you make money. Most entrepreneurs have a good sense of identifying problems, but very few entrepreneurs answer the question of why they believe their solution is what the users want. As we mentioned earlier, the concept of lean entrepreneurship is about validating whether this idea is feasible, and I believe everyone understands this principle. However, when it comes to practical implementation, to what extent should you validate it? Regarding this point, the author introduces a very important concept in this book called Implicit Assumptions. By avoiding implicit assumptions, you can gain a true understanding of user needs. What is meant by implicit assumption? It refers to the premises that we are not aware of. For example, when we meet a new friend at a gathering, we often say, let's add each other on WeChat. We think it sounds natural, but there is an implicit assumption in this sentence, which is that the other person also uses WeChat. The reason why we don't ask, do you have WeChat, first and instead directly say, let's add each other on WeChat is because we are too confident. We assume that the other person must have WeChat but this assumption may not be correct. You must first ask, do you have WeChat, to verify this assumption. This kind of implicit assumption is also a common mistake made by entrepreneurs. The mindset of lean startup is similar to the question, do you have WeChat? It helps entrepreneurs avoid making assumptions. How do we validate the correctness of hidden assumptions in lean entrepreneurship? Let's break down the hidden assumptions. Specifically, there are two aspects to hidden assumptions, value assumptions, and growth assumptions. Let's take a look at these two assumptions separately. First, let's consider the value assumption. The value assumption is that when you decide to create a product or a feature, there is an underlying assumption that it is valuable to the users. Before you start working on it, you must validate this assumption. For example, India is not a very wealthy country. Only 7% of the population can afford to buy a washing machine. Most people either wash their clothes themselves or hire laundry workers. How do these laundry workers wash clothes? They take the clothes to the river to wash them, and it takes 2 to 7 days for them to dry. So, it often takes about 10 days for the clothes to be returned to the owners. It seems like starting a laundry service in India would be a good business opportunity. A young man who worked at Procter & Gamble discovered this opportunity and quit his job to start his own laundry company. At this point, he needed to validate one thing, would people actually pay to have their clothes washed by him? So, he found a large truck, installed a washing machine at the back, and drove the truck to villages to see if people would be interested. This young man went to different villages for a week, but very few people were willing to come and wash their clothes. He repeatedly tried different locations, such as streets and in front of supermarkets, but the results were not ideal. So, he went to talk to the villagers and asked them why they were not willing to pay him to wash their clothes. The villagers said, if you take my clothes and drive away, where can I find you? Hi, it turns out that the villagers are not uninterested in laundry services, but rather worried that you might run away. The young man knew what to do and modified his truck to make it look like a mobile stall instead of a vehicle. This time, people started coming and spending money to have their clothes washed. Through these adjustments, the young man quickly validated his assumption of value. He realized that there was a genuine demand and also figured out which services the villagers were interested in and what prices they were willing to accept. For example, He discovered that the villagers wanted ironing services and were willing to pay double the price to get their clothes back within four hours instead of waiting until the next day. These feedbacks confirmed that providing laundry services was valuable to customers. The company soon improved their mobile stall service and expanded their business to several cities in India. Take another counterexample. There was once a startup company in Silicon Valley that sought advice from the author of this book, Eric Rice. They had created an online education website where many users came to listen to lectures and learn. They noticed that under certain courses, there was frequent commenting and interaction among users. 
They believed that since it was a learning platform, studying together would be more enjoyable and efficient, just like how we see classrooms and classmates in schools. As a result, they introduced a social feature that allowed students to add each other as friends, which made them more willing to pay for the courses. It is obvious and reasonable that communication among classmates is helpful for learning, which is common knowledge. Unfortunately, they wasted their efforts because not many people use this feature, and it did not increase everyone's willingness to pay. Why is this the case? It is because their idea of introducing social features was that students could study together, and everyone would surely prefer it. This judgment is based on the hidden value assumption that social interaction is helpful for users during lectures and that socializing during the learning process is valuable. From a common-sense perspective, it may seem unnecessary to validate this assumption, but the result is that users are telling you through their actions that they do not want social interaction when they come to the website for lectures. This is the consequence of not validating the value assumption. Why do we have to validate value assumptions? Because entrepreneurs are also ordinary people, and we have too many inherent biases in our thinking. Before giving the product and features to the users, our understanding of their attitudes is actually zero. The value of the product is just an assumption, and we need to verify its authenticity. The solution provided by Lean Startup is to create a minimum viable product, just like the Indian Laundry Company mentioned earlier, hiring a truck to transport a washing machine around the village. This doesn't cost much, but it helps us determine whether customers really want their services. This is the first assumption, the value assumption. There is another assumption that you also need to verify, which is the growth assumption. After your product has gained user recognition through the initial value proposition, you still need to validate whether your product can be used by more users and if your existing users will help spread the word about your product. This assumption is often overlooked because people believe that if we have already validated that what we are doing is valuable, the user base will naturally grow over time. However, this is not always the case, and the growth assumption also needs to be validated. So how do you validate it? Is it enough to look at the numbers and see that the total number of users for your product keeps increasing, proving that it has no issues with growth? In reality, validating whether a product can sustainably grow is quite simple, you just need to know how new users perceive your product. The author of this book, Eric Rice, provides an example from his own experience. Everyone knows that Google has a type of keyword advertising. When you search for a certain keyword on Google, the web page you click on will have many advertisements. The companies behind these ads pay Google to promote their ads when someone searches for that keyword. When Google first introduced keyword advertising, the fees were very cheap. Eric Schmidt's company used to allocate a budget of $5 per day to buy Google's keyword ads. How many clicks could $5 buy? 100 clicks. In other words, they could bring in 100 new users every day with $5. This number may be small, but it is invaluable for validating growth assumptions. As long as you analyze the behavior of these 100 new users every day, such as how many clicks, registrations, retentions, and payments there are, etc., if the usage data of these 100 new users is good, it means that your product, at least the current version, has no problem with growth. If these 100 people are not interested in the product, then you need to carefully consider what the problem might be. Many startup companies, in practice, only look at user downloads or total active numbers. As long as they see these numbers increasing every week, they become complacent and believe that future product growth is not a problem. The author says that total data is often vanity metrics and cannot validate your growth assumptions. Be cautious. The validation of value assumptions and growth assumptions is the core secret to advancing lean entrepreneurial thinking. And you need to pay special attention that the validation of these two assumptions is not a one-time thing. It's not something you do at the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey and then forget about it. In fact, they are ongoing. Every time your product is updated, every time a new feature is added, every time a version is iterated, you need to validate these two assumptions. Otherwise, 
How would you know if your product is on the right track or if it's going off course? This is the second viewpoint on how to achieve lean entrepreneurship. Part 3. The third point of this book is that lean startup is not just a theory of entrepreneurship, but it also applies to areas beyond entrepreneurship. Many people may think that there are too many books on how to start a business, but in such a big world, how many people can actually become entrepreneurs? What's the use of knowing how to start a lean business? Actually, although this is a book about entrepreneurship, it is suitable for anyone who takes their work seriously. After reading this book, I have a clear feeling that it is not fundamentally about entrepreneurship. It actually talks about a mindset for viewing the world and a methodology for approaching work scientifically, which is applicable to people who are not starting a business as well. The book provides many real-life scenarios, and I will share a few of them with you. For example, if you are an elementary school math teacher and you want your students to learn faster, what should you do according to the principles of Lean Startup? You find this difficult because the only tools you can use are textbooks and teaching methods. The textbooks are standardized, and although you can write your own, it's not possible to write one, observe student reactions, iterate quickly, and constantly make changes as you don't have the energy for it. At the same time, you can improve your teaching methods, but with dozens of students in one class, it's still quite risky to try a new approach. Plus, your class time is precious, and it's practically impossible to individually experiment with each student to see the effects. The author says that there is a teaching tool called School Mobilization Online, which allows teachers to record teaching videos using this tool. Then, based on each student's level and learning style, different course videos are sent to students every day. For fast learners, more challenging content is pushed, while for slow learners, simpler content is pushed. Teachers can see the learning data of each student. The author says that with this tool, you can achieve a lean startup style teaching because if you try to explain a math problem using a new teaching method, you don't have to fear uncertain results. You just need to send it to a few students on a small scale and see the effect of this new method on them. If their feedback is good, you can immediately promote the new method to every student. If it's not good, you can continuously improve it, just like product iteration, until it can be promoted to all students. For example, lean startup thinking can also be applied to TV drama production. We can start by shooting a sample episode that lasts several tens of minutes, introducing the main character relationships, conflicts, and story background. Then, we can invite several tens of audience members to participate in a small-scale test screening, and based on their feedback, decide on the necessary modifications to the plot, whether adjustments to the actors are needed, and whether to proceed with production. At the end of each season, the production team will make decisions on whether to cancel the show or order a new season based on ratings and audience opinions. This model of shooting and broadcasting on a weekly basis gives all decision-making power to the audience, minimizing the production team's investment costs and risks of failure. This is a typical lean startup approach. In fact, friends who often watch American dramas are aware that this is how American dramas are produced. Also, hospital laboratories can use lean startup thinking to transform their processes. We know that hospital laboratories typically collect blood samples once every hour because doctors who draw blood usually collect samples from many patients within that hour and then send all the samples together to the laboratory. However, this practice makes patients wait longer to receive their test results and may potentially affect the accuracy of the tests. By changing the process with a lean startup mindset, hospitals should have doctors send blood samples from one or two patients to the laboratory each time. Although this may require the laboratory to have an additional staff member, the laboratory can process the tests faster because they no longer need to carefully sort, classify, and match the blood samples. This reduces the waiting time for patients, provides faster medical feedback, and ultimately lowers the hospital's costs. Nowadays, many hospital laboratories have already adopted this method of processing tests in small batches and at a faster pace. Finally, let's give an example of selling goods. Suppose you sell car parts, and customers have various demands. 
you need to purchase a large quantity of various car parts in the warehouse. However, the high cost of inventory requires you to pay for transportation and storage fees. If the quantity is large, it also takes a lot of time and effort to search for them. What's even worse is that some batches of parts you receive from the manufacturer may have problems, but you didn't notice it. It's only when the customer comes to buy that you discover the issue. You have to go back to the factory to exchange them, but the customer has already gone somewhere else. This results in additional transportation costs and time wasted, and you miss out on a business opportunity. How can we avoid this rigid and inefficient situation? The answer lies in the mindset of lean entrepreneurship. You should avoid purchasing in large quantities, instead, only purchase a few of each component and replenish from the supplier as soon as one is used up, ensuring a continuous supply. You may say that this is troublesome, as purchasing in small quantities would increase costs. However, you need to understand that compared to the costs of storing and searching for large quantities, this cost is negligible. What's more important is that by doing so, you can quickly identify and respond to any issues with the components. Otherwise, if there is a problem, the entire batch of goods will be wasted, resulting in missed business opportunities and the need to replace the goods in bulk, which obviously incurs higher costs. Summary The above is some inspiration that Lean Startup brings to our daily lives. In summary, the book Lean Startup introduces the concept of Lean Startup, using low-cost and small-batch production methods to adapt to rapidly changing markets and prevent waste caused by rocket-style startups. The book also tells us the implementation path of Lean Startup, which is to validate value assumptions and growth assumptions, and not to fall into the trap of false indicators. Finally, the author also points out many applications of Lean Startup thinking in our lives. In summary, the book The Lean Startup brings us a new way of understanding the world, especially in this fast-paced and efficiency-driven era. The mindset of Lean Startup can help us better adapt to this era. For friends who are entrepreneurs, this book is even more relevant. Reflecting on our own products, we can consider which decisions were made impulsively and which assumptions were not validated, and whether we are still chasing false indicators of prosperity. Congratulations on finishing another book. Thank you for your support, please subscribe to our Wisdom Planet audiobook channel. Like and share it with family and friends. Wisdom worth spreading and opening up a better future. Thank you and see you again.